بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الشيخ ابن عثيمين رحمه الله he authored a short treatise and he entitled it rights that the fitra calls to and the sharia has established and what are these rights these are rights which we have to fulfill meaning these are rights which are obligated upon you to fulfill the first right and the most important right and the most obligatory of rights is the right of Allah Azza wa Jal. And that is the right of Allah Subhanahu to your worship that you have to single out Allah in all three types of Tawheed and that we do not ascribe partners to Him. We have to single out Allah with Tawheed al rububiyyah and we have to single out Allah with Tawheed al uluhiyyah such that we do not worship anybody besides Allah. And we have to single out Allah in His names and attributes. And singling out Allah in His rububiyyah is to single out Allah that He is the Creator and He is the Provider and in His hands is life and death and He controls everything. Meaning, it's not permitted for a person to say, why do we pray two raka'at for Fajr and four raka'at for Dhuhr? You, you the questioner, are you the worshipper or are you the Lord? And it is the Lord who commands and as for the person or the worshipper, he says we heard we, and we obeyed. And the second type of Tawheed is Tawheed al uluhiyyah that we do not worship anybody else besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We do not worship stones, nor idols, nor jinns, and we do not seek closeness to them, we do not slaughter in the, for them. And also the right of Allah in His names and His attributes that we affirm everything which Allah subhanahu has affirmed for Himself in His book and in the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam from the names and the attributes. And we have to affirm these names and attributes for Allah whilst negating any equal or comparison with Allah. And then the second right upon us is the right of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And this Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, we have to obey him in everything which he commanded us to do so. And we have to believe everything which he informed us of. Even if you aren't able to completely comprehend this issue. And also, ijtinab, meaning remaining far distanced from everything which the Prophet ﷺ forbade us from. And that we should not worship Allah except in a manner which the Prophet ﷺ did so. Meaning we have to follow and not innovate. And so this Prophet ﷺ, we have to affirm for him the two ranks. The rank of al ubudiyya the station of al ubudiyya that he is the worshipper of Allah and he should not be worshipped. And then the status of, or the station of al risala that he was given the prophethood and therefore he's not denied or disbelieved in. And then after this, the rights of the two parents. And this right of obedience to the two parents this applies if they are, Mus are non-Muslims. Even if they are non-Muslims, they have to be shown goodness. So they have to be obeyed as long as Allah subhanahu is not disobeyed. Allah subhanahu is not disobeyed. So we have to obey our parents, but not in the disobedience of Allah. And we have to show them goodness. And we don't raise our voices with them. And we have to have a righteous companionship with them. More so in the old age when they advance in their years. And this is because when our parents grow old and the child also grows old, then the child feels that he is in a stage in his life where he's almost equal or close to them. And if a person says that my father is a non-Muslim, how should I behave? We say that it is imperative that you have to show him obedience. And that we have to understand that Islam orders us to show goodness and obedience to our parents even if they are non-Muslims. And you have to love your parents even if they are non-Muslims. However, this love is a natural form of love. Meaning you love him because he is your father. But at the same time, you don't love that which he is doing in terms of shirk and other similar actions. And it's not permitted for the child to participate with his father in the festivals and the a'yad. And for example, you don't sit with him whilst he is drinking alcohol. 
and also advising him politely and gently and supplicating, making dua for him that he is guided. And if a person says, how you want me to supplicate for a non-Muslim? Yes, did the Prophet ﷺ not supplicate for his people? The most deserving of people for your supplications are your parents. And then after this, a Shaykh Ibn Uthmeen rahimullah, he said, the rights of the children. The rights between the parents and the children, these are mutual rights. That the child has to fulfill the rights of the parents and the parents have to fulfill the rights of the children. So the father has to spend upon the child and cultivate him with a good tarbiyah and also spending upon him in a manner which is good. Also choosing for his child a good name and the child has to obey his parents. So there are rights which the child has to fulfill towards the parents and there are rights which the parents have to fulfill towards the children. Minha from amongst them, from the rights of the child upon the parents is that the father or the parents have to command the children with the five prayers after they are seven years old. And the most important matter when it comes to the cultivation of the children is for them to be diligent over the five obligatory salah. And if you as the father, if you do not want your child to be playing on the phone, then you as a father don't play on the phone. And if you as the mother, you want your daughter to be wearing the hijab and covering herself properly, then you also have to cover yourself properly and wear the hijab. And in one of the countries, I visited, I visited a family and this family memorized the Quran and they memorized Islamic texts, al fiyat ibn Malik and other texts. And I asked them that how were you able to cultivate this environment within this country? And when I asked the father, how were you able to cultivate your child upon this memorization and this knowledge in this type of country, this environment? He replied that when I got married and we found out that my wife was carrying a child, I thought to myself, what would I like my child to grow up as? And I thought that I want him to be a hafiz. So me and my wife, we began making hifth of the Quran and as the child was born, we had more, both memorized the Quran. And then after this, as we would memorize other Islamic sciences, we would teach the child. And then the next right is the right of the relatives, even if they are kuffar. A person has to keep their connection and their relationships with his two parents. And also keeping the ties of kinship, i.e. with the relatives. And if a person says that how can I keep the ties of kinship with my relatives and I am living in Britain and they are in Morocco, I'm not able to do so. And then we reply, that whatever you are able to do so, you have to do and fulfill. Some people, they don't even have, they don't even have the contact number for his, for, the, for his uncle. So what should you do? You know that when Eid comes, for example, and how your family works and how Islam works, that you have to ring your relatives. And this doesn't mean that you send a, or you broadcast a group message to them like you would broadcast to any, everybody else. Rather, you physically reach out to them and connect with them and you ring them. And also when you speak to your mother, perhaps you speak to every two or three days or every week at the, at the worst case scenario. When you speak to your mother, you say, if you speak to my uncles or my aunties, then convey my salam to them. And then your mother, when she speaks to her brothers and sisters and she says, my son sends his salam to you and they reply, how good of a son this, this son is, how, ibi, how, how obedient your son is. And is this something which is difficult? And also, if somebody gets married amongst your relatives, or somebody dies amongst your relatives, you ring them, you connect with them. If it's a marriage, you give them congratulations. If it's a death, you give them condolences. But what happens nowadays, that a person within the family passes away and nobody had even bothered to speak to that individual who has passed and neither did they ever used to ask about him until that person passes away and then all the family they begin to come and they meet and they congr congregate and then they come to the house of the deceased the deceased and his relatives and they know that they're going to be having breakfast and lunch and dinner and it's all going to be free and do you think 
that those same people, they are now congregating in order to weep over the disease is only because of the free food and, and then to converse and speak about politics and other matters and at the same time smoking cigarettes and then they sit there talk and they say he was so beloved to us and now he's passed away is it only now that he has become beloved to you was he never beloved to you before when he was alive and gathering in the house of the deceased is from the major sins because it is from niyaha and niyaha was from the traits of al jahiliya from the practices of jahiliya and and because during jahiliya all of them they would congregate in the house of the deceased and they would raise their voices and even if they become angry upon you but you should fear the anger of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the most you should do is go visit them give the condolences and leave because the people who struggle the most at this moment with this type of condolences are the family of the deceased. And if somebody said to you, but who said that we are burdened or we feel tired as the family of the deceased? And they'll say that we don't become tired and we're not burdened because we have a way out. What do you do? They'll say that in the previous times, everybody used to come and congregate in our houses. And this one used to enter and that one used to exit and then the house would be damaged. But now we've found a way is this way that you found that you've stopped the gatherings and the congregations? They said no, in fact we've increased in the gathering and we have opened the doors for everybody to What do you do? We'll enter the mosques and we'll, we'll congregate in the mosques and everything will be in the mosque Because for the mosque to be damaged there's no problem If a deceased person passed away, would you bury that person in your house? They'll say by Allah no and never have we seen a person being buried in their houses but rather they'll want him to be buried in the masjid so we congregate in the masjid we'll eat in the masjid we'll drink in the masjid no, no. we'll sleep in the masjid we're going to speak about politics in the masjid and if you say to them but the masjid is going to be damaged they'll say but why was the masjid built in the first place and allah subhanahu mentions in the quran the meaning of which is and more and who is more oppressive than the one who prevents the name of Allah being mentioned and remembered in the masjid. So this is the most oppressive type of person. And then in addition to this, play and dancing in the masjid and music in the mosques like these ringtones. And some people, they're not prevented from looking at their phones and looking at YouTubes, uh, looking at YouTube and watching films in the masjid. As for his own house, no. He's going to safeguard his house. So this is the house of whom? This is the house of Allah. Our brothers, the great elephant, that great animal, it was not able to violate the house of Allah. That great elephant, it was not able to violate the house of Allah. And nowadays people easily violate the house of Allah. When it comes to eating and drinking, there's nothing preventing a person eating or drinking in the masjid. But there has to be a limit. If a person sleeps in the masjid but within limits, meaning it's possible that in Ramadan we eat. As for eating from the adhan of Maghrib all the way to the Isha and then constantly eating and drinking and talking and, and laughing in the masjid. And then after this is the right of the neighbor. And there are three types of neighbors. The first type of neighbor is the neighbor who is a Muslim and a relative of yours. And this Muslim relative neighbor has three rights upon you. The rights of being a Muslim, the rights of Islam, and, and the rights of being a neighbor. So all of these three rights are combined within this one person. And then the second type of neighbor is a Muslim neighbor who is not a relative. And he has two rights upon you. The right of being a Muslim, the right of Islam, and the right of being your neighbor. And then the third type of neighbor is just a neighbor, meaning a neighbor who is a non-Muslim, not a Muslim. And he has the right of being your neighbor, meaning that you're not permitted to irritate him. And you have to call him to Islam, give him gifts. And the Prophet wasallam, he mentioned the extent of this. And he said that even if you're cooking some type of soup, that you dilute the soup further with water so you can give some of it to your neighbors. And also the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that Jibreel salam he kept coming to me and admonishing me regarding the rights of the neighbor, admonishing me regarding the rights of the neighbor until I thought that perhaps the neighbor will inherit from my wealth. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, am I a believer? 
And the Prophet ﷺ replied, go ask your neighbor. Why? Because your neighbor is the one who knows what you are like. Do you pray? Do you fast? Do you act according to Islam? Do you act according to Iman? Are you good towards your neighbor? Do you park your car in front of his gate or around the side? Do you send your children to spoil and irritate him? And then the next right is the right of every Muslim. Firstly, that you have to be sincere in your advice for your Muslim brother. And you have to love every Muslim. If he is ill, you come and visit him. But you don't visit him whilst he's eating or taking his medicine. Rather, you visit him for those brief moments in that specific time. You give him salam, you make dua for him and then you leave. So, being sincere in your advice towards the Muslim. And the Prophet wasallam said, None of you can attain complete Iman until he loves for his brother that which he loves for himself. And how do you love for people to call you? You love for people to call you Abu al-Abbas. So in the same manner you call out and dress others. And do you love for people to meet you and they are frowning? No. You love for people to meet you and you're smiling and so treat others like you give him the greetings of you ask regarding his situation you help and assist him if a person says but i don't have wealth by which i can assist and it's not necessary that you have to assist him with wealth you can in fact assist him with a good word you can say to him that look you are with allah allah is with you and allah will not abandon you and that person becomes happy and perhaps you can assist him in matters which don't which doesn't require spending for example if you find him carrying bags, you, you help him and you carry those bags with him. And if you're not able to help him in any manner, the Prophet ﷺ told us, then stop harming him. And this is oldness, also goodness for you to stop harming him. And then lastly, the rights of the non-Muslims upon you. And if a person says, MashaAllah, even the non-Muslims now have a right upon us. And we reply that non-Muslims should be aware that this religion, it has obligated upon the Muslims rights of the non-Muslims. How did the Prophet wasallam used to behave with and interact with the non-Muslims? Was it through bad manners? And some of the ulama have mentioned that had the Prophet wasallam done nothing except interact with the non-Muslims in a good manner, then this would have been sufficient for the Prophet Sallallahu to overcome them, meaning not overcome them with, this, with his sword, but overcome them with good manners. And so we have to be sincere in our advice towards the non-Muslims. And we have to be compassionate and fear the fire for the non-Muslims. So you have to fear Allah and not belittle the non-Muslims. And don't say to the non-Muslims that you're upon goodness because you're cheating him. Rather tell him that come to this way, come to Islam, come to guidance, I fear the fire for you. And also, we have to be in the correct middle course. And I'm going to finish, or, uh, finish this lecture with a story. One of the Eastern European countries, in, in one of the Eastern European countries, the masjid was situated in a place where on its right and left, and also behind it, was a brewery or a pub. So the pub or the brewery which was in front of the masjid they had security guards at the door and these security guards they were so big and strong that maybe they wouldn't even enter into this door and this security guard at the door of the pub he would see every day people muslims entering into the masjid and so he wanted to know he was curious as to what is inside the masjid strong so he was strong so he entered into the masjid and then he climbed upstairs and he found the Muslims and he did not find them playing on their phones, no leaning and lying down. And he did not see them eating and drinking. Otherwise, it would be no different from the place that he is in. Rather, he saw them praying and reciting Quran. And he asked them that, what are you doing in this, in this place? They said, we are worshipping Allah. And he said, but where's the alcohol? The Muslims replied, there's no alcohol here. Where are the women? And the Muslims replied, that the women are in that place, they have a separate hall. And where's music? And they replied that there's no music here, but we have the recitation of the Quran. He said, Subhanallah, then I want to be a Muslim. Because I want to be amongst you people and not them people. And so he accepted Islam. So he came back home and he went to his wife. And when he returned home, he said to his wife, I've become a Muslim. 
and he said to his wife that you have to enter into Islam and also his wife accepted Islam and then he mentioned that there was an occasion or a party at the house of his in-laws and so he with his wife they traveled the distance of a journey approximately until they reached the door of his father and mother-in-law and he mentioned that we saw on the table which normally contains food and drink but it's all loss and destruction swine and al alcohol and everything and so this brother this the security guard he found a place on the side and he did not sit with him and then his father-in-law and so his father-in-law he asks his daughter yani the wife of the, the and the father-in-law is a rich wealthy person very well respected in the family so he said to his daughter i.e the wife of the man why doesn't he come and sit with us and she replied that he's a muslim and then the father said what do you mean he's a muslim she replied that he's a muslim doesn't eat swine pork doesn't drink alcohol doesn't dance and then the father said but then how does he live how does he live in this dunya and he's not drinking alcohol or none of these matters and she replied that a good life is not possible except without alcohol and these are the matters and the, the father replied no he's a muslim and therefore he's probably beating you and she replied that since the day he accepted islam he has never done anything wrong against me meaning he's never raised his voice never mind hit me because islam it teaches us to be good towards our wives. So the father, he's sitting and he said to his wife, sorry, he said to his daughter, call your husband over. And now the security guard, he came and the father and his father-in-law began to insult him. And the father-in-law said to him that you're this and this and he's insulting him and telling him that, look, you've now uh, divided our family. And he, the security guard, the Muslim brother, he replied to his father-in-law, that my religion of Islam, it prevents me from replying to you in this manner. It prevents me from replying to an insult or a swear with an insult and a swear. And the, the brother, he was telling us that the rest of the family members, they were saying to the father-in-law that leave him, let him do his thing. We'll do our own thing. We'll take his share of drinking and eating. Don't let him spoil our occasion. And so our brother, this security guard, he began speaking to his father-in-law and explaining Islam to him. And yet the father-in-law kept replying with insults and swears. And those who are present in the gathering are telling the father, just leave him, abandon him. Yeah. And he mentioned that after only a few minutes of this conversation, the father said to the security guard, how do I accept Islam? And so those people who had attended the event, the security guard brother, he mentioned that they gripped hold of me to try to, me for, to try to force me out of the house because if he now accepts Islam, this is a bigger problem. So he said, I patted them away. <laughs> and then I went forward. And so the security guard, he said to his father-in-law, say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Meaning he taught his father <laughs> and he explained. And then the father-in-law, who was a little bit older, he said, look, I can't say the whole statement at once. So teach me word by word. So he began to verbally teach him word by word, repeating each word. And the, and the security guard mentioned that I would say the statement and he would try to repeat it. And then we say, repeat it once more. He said until three times, we both repeated the Shahada. And then after the third time, he was able to uh, verbalize the Shahada completely. And, and then the, the gathering and those who were there present at the event, there were problems in that, on that occasion until the father-in-law who was older, he became tired. And so they took this old man and, he took the, and they took him to a room and they said only a few minutes and he passed away. And he mentioned that at that time, I realized that I have to call to Allah and give da'wah to the people. But I have to do it according to the mannerisms of the Prophet ﷺ. Because if I had treated them as me, the security guard, and being rough and tough, then all of this goodness wouldn't have, would not have occurred. Each one of you in this country is a caller to Allah, whether you accept it or you refuse it. And you don't have to be a caller to Allah by your tongue, but 
call them through your actions because the non-Muslims they are looking at you. Allahumma ya hayya qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghith maslih lana sha'nana kulla wa la takinna ila anfusina tarfata ayna abada wallahu a'lam sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa jazakum allahu khayran.